received um, reports some years ago, a couple of years ago, about the estimated amounts lost to our economy through state capture. Well, they proved to be hopelessly hopeless underestimates. Now we're talking about anything up to a trillion rand that was lost to our economy through state capture in its various forms. It wasn't just one single event. It wasn't only the Guptas, but we know that the Gupta brothers played a fundamental role with the full support then of the then president of the country and various ministers of state. We've heard it all on the, through the Zondo Commission. Um, we now have to work together to turn this around. So um, we have to become, as much as the Kathrada Foundation celebrates the work and walks in the footsteps of those that, are, that, that we regard as iconic liberation fighters, freedom fighters, we now really have to become anti-corruption fighters and we have to fight this fight together. So um, we have uh, many organizations here. We have Corruption Watch, OTA, the SACP, Defend Our Democracy, Right to Know, and we have international organizations with us today. So without me saying, saying much more, we, we all know that at this point that a, <clears throat> there is an extradition agreement with United Arab Emirates. Uh, we have reason to believe, or most people believe that the Guptas and in particular those, uh, the Gupta brothers who are facing warrants of arrest in South Africa are living in the United Arab Emirates, possibly in India, but the evidence points to them living in the, in the UAE. Uh, we need action taken. So the extradition agreement is only one step towards that action. Um, international pressure is, in, is exceedingly important in getting the governments that have the, that have the power to act, to act decisively and to act swiftly. It is really a travesty of justice that this uh, corruption, grand corruption, which uh, was really felt by the poorest people in our society more than anyone else, this grand corruption, the perpetrators of the corruption are walking scot-free in another country in the world. It just is not acceptable. And uh, so I think this, uh, this campaign is extremely important. It must be seen as part of our overall campaign jointly to combat corruption. But combating corruption has to take specific forms. There have to be specific actions. It can't just be a slogan. It has to be followed by the kind of action that people want to see. It is a travesty of justice that the Gupta brothers, who stole so much from our country, are walking free in another country in the world. We want to see justice done. They are effectively fugitives from justice. And uh, we, we do need international cooperation to ensure that with respect to the Gupta brothers, that justice is done and seen to be done. So with those few words, thanks once again for joining us in this meeting. Um, I think we need to probe, we, we, we need to go beyond just uh, expressing our abhorrence of, of corruption, but start talking about concrete steps that we can take to collectively fight, fight the scourge of corruption. Thanks very much, Sean. Thanks, Derek. Um... You know, I, I, I've just been looking at the terms of reference for the Zondo Commission. There are nine terms of reference there. Five of them directly refer to the Guptas and the Gupta family. Um, and and I, I think it's just remarkable uh, that, that almost the entire focus of that commission has been on the involvement uh, of, of this family in in, in, in enhancing and carrying out state capture. Um, and as we've come to learn now that the templates that they created or perhaps, perhaps perfected has been rolled out throughout the length and breadth of the country and, and leaving us with a continuity of this issue that will now have to be grappled with. We now will take Nabila Khan who has been driving this project who has really spent the last few months uh, immersed in understanding the Gupta Empire, all of their associates, as well as liaising with all of the role players who are here today, local and international, uh, to champion the idea of this campaign. 
to Nabila and all of those that you work with, I think it's just a sense of appreciation for your work. As I call on you, just to talk to us about this campaign. Nabila, over to you. Thank you, Mr. B. Um, and a good afternoon to everybody joining us, both from South Africa and internationally. Um, so I'm just going to take everyone through a presentation that I've pulled together on this campaign and what exactly it is about. Um, so before we really go into how this, what the, the fundamentals in the makeup of this campaign, I think, you know, it's incredibly important for us to understand the context um, and the history that led to this point that we are currently at today. Um, so who essentially are the Guptas, right? So the Gupta family, as we all know, um, have their roots, roots in India and migrated to South Africa in 1993. Um, the prominent members of this family being the three brothers who have been in the news over the past few years, and that is Ajay, Atul, and Rajesh, or otherwise known as Tony Gupta. Um, in 1993, Atul founded Sahara Computers, and this was the family's first business in South Africa. Coal mines, computers, newspapers, and media outlets are, are some of the other organizations that are among the Gupta family companies. In 2013, we had the infamous Waterkloof landing that sort of launched the Gupta name into the spotlight. Following that, there were several allegations about the Gupta's influence over cabinet nominations in South Africa, and that surfaced in 2016. In 2017, the Guptas, the Guptas were summoned over the Frieda Farm project in which a trail of hacked emails linked the Guptas to government funds rooted in Atul Gupta's account. So what are the charges? The investigating directorate obtained warrants of arrest for Atul Gupta and some of his relatives and associates. The warrants are related to a 25 million rand fraud um, and money laundering case in the fee state. According to the ID, this relates to alleged procurement fraud involving 29, sorry, 24.9 million rand paid between November 2011 and April of 2012 by the Free State Department of Agriculture to Milani Investments, a company owned and controlled by Iqbal Sharma. From there, the, the funds were allegedly diverted to Islandside Investments, PTY Limited, a company owned and controlled by the Gupta family. In July of this year, the foundation hosted a Shadow World Investigations Paul Holden in a discussion that unpacked state capture and the Gupta's role and really showed the, the research that Shadow World undertook to really track the money and look at what the total cost of state capture really was. And it came up to the, the estimated or alleged amount of state capture is almost 60 million billion rand. In further research conducted by Shadow World Investigations, what we found was some of the primary states of state capture was the Free State Government, ESCOM, and Transnet. So where do we stand right now? As it stands at this current point in time, the Gupta family has fled South Africa, as we all are aware, and are presumed to be living in Dubai. On the 9th of July, 2021, an extradition treaty between the UAE and South Africa was signed. It was exactly this, the, the, the foundation and the alleged crimes that are facing the Gupta brothers and their associates, as well as the call made by Reverend Frank Chikane in that same uh, webinar in July that led to us thinking around how do we form a global collaboration and action that seeks to really bring back the Guptas to South Africa to account for the alleged criminal activities and corrupt activities. So the international campaign to bring back the Guptas has several has a few aims. The first being to ensure that the said corrupt activities committed by the Guptas and their associates remain in the public spotlight. Secondly, to lobby country ambassadors, officials, and bodies of authority to consider actions against the Gupta family and their businesses in their respective areas. And thirdly, to advocate and mobilize for the sex successful extradition of the Guptas to South Africa. This foundation is also embedded in these key fundamental campaign pillars, that being advocacy and lobby work, public, and public education and awareness work, and thirdly, to put pressure on all the responsible parties to speed up the extradition and prosecution of the implicated Gupta family members and their associates. 
these campaign pillars work hand in hand with the campaign aims and it helps us to see how we can actually reach and achieve the set out aims and objectives of this um, international campaign so going forward for 2022 as well as this campaign as a whole there are a few key actions that we will the campaign will be undertaking and these actions work hand in hand and complement each complement each other in helping achieve the set out goal so the first will be and this will commence in feb of 2022 ongoing lobbying engagement with country officials and authorities so the campaign will seek to engage with country officials ambassadors bodies of authority to understand what are the diplomatic pressures that we can actually use to facilitate this campaign and to understand where are the opportunities for work i think you know an important part of this campaign is acknowledging the fact that corruption state capture bringing the guptas back to south africa these are all act activities that cannot be done in isolation it requires collaborative work um, so it's it's really looking at bringing in civil society together with government together with activists and your everyday citizens to see how we can work together in a holistic and, and constructive manner to, to help facilitate the campaign. Secondly, it's carrying out public education and awareness sessions with communities. And this one is really aimed at hosting workshops and in sessions in communities around issues of corruption. And how does corruption actually affect an individual on the ground? What are the, the, the social and economic and political impacts of corruption i think you know another important uh, point for this campaign was the acknowledgement that what what we saw with the gupta is the, the alleged corrupt activities that they, they they carried out with corruption as a whole it has a very direct victim and often it's the poor of the country and so it's very important to understand how corruption affects you at a grassroots level and to take it out of a conversation that 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 really usually focuses on a state level um, thirdly, is shedding light on the human cost of corruption. Um, this particular one is, is really looking at how do we engage and have conversations with former employees of Gupta-led or Gupta-linked companies. Um, these are individuals who, by no intention of their own, became victims of the Gupta's corrupt actions and their associates as well. So it's really providing them with a platform to express what they, what they went through and to share their truth around the situation. And then lastly, it will be an ongoing Orange Book Faces of Corruption's digital handbook. Now the Orange Book um, Faces of Corruption is a digital handbook that lists and details all who were and associated with the Guptas. And the objectives of this Orange Book is to firstly create awareness around the Gupta accomplices, advocate for them to answer for the alleged corrupt activities and to facilitate public education around corruption networks this orange book is incredibly important because again it drives home the message that corruption does not does not occur in a vacuum it, it requires a network in a web of individuals who collectively work together to carry out these corrupt activities and this book aims to highlight that and to highlight the extent of corrupt networks um, and then lastly, these are just some of the, the, the current campaign partners who have been working very closely with myself and the foundation to help lay down the foundation, the thinking, um, the, the key activities and how we really should be looking at taking this work forward in 2022. And so those organizations are OUTA, Corruption Watch, Action for Southern Africa, Interna International Lawyers Project, Shadow World Investigation, Human Rights First, and as well as Lord Peter Hain. Um, throughout 2022 um campaign the campaign partners will look at um really diversifying and and you know extending our reach as much as we can because again you know the the ultimate aim of this campaign is collaboration international collaboration and having this launch of this campaign on international anti-corruption day is incredibly significant for us because international anti-corruption day sends a very clear message that corruption is a global concern and in order to in order to ensure justice there needs to be global action so um we thank you for your time and um if there are any comments um any questions on the set out presentation please feel free to put this into the chat box and um yes thank you so much mr b back to you thank, thanks, Nobila. thanks Nobila. um wonderful presentation 
I think what we'd like to do, what we'd like to have from the audience here, thoughts, ideas, suggestions, proposals on to strengthen their campaign that you've now heard about, please put that in the chat facility. Any other comments as well, please put it in the chat facility uh, and, and, and we will try and come back to you. Uh, the, the, the Orange Book is something we will launch in 2022. Um, work around it has started, and that, that will be one of the first outputs of the campaign early in 2022. Before I call Reverend Chikane, I just want to read a short extract from the book by Temba Maseko for my country. Temba writes about a meeting that is called to by, the, by Ajay Gupta, and he says, without wasting time on formalities, Ajay starts started telling me why he wanted to meet with me. He told me that his family was in the process of setting up a media company and he needed the government to support him in, in, in the forms of advertising. Within two minutes, he got straight to the point. I am aware that government spends around 600 million on advertising across media platforms, and I want that expenditure to be transferred to my company. Temba says, well, you know, uh, he can't do that. The J says, listen, this is how things is going to work. You must go to all the departments, talk to the ministers, tell them to transfer their budgets into your account. And your only job is to make sure the money comes back to me and the new age newspaper. You, 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 you hear me, he barked. Um, he goes on to say, now, this is how the system works from now. If there's any minister who is not cooperative, you should tell me and I will sort them out. Temba then goes on in the book later on to, to almost give a verbatim account. Um, and he concludes that verbatim account with Ajay saying, no, you listen, I will not tolerate any nonsense from you because you don't understand what's going on. I will speak to your superiors and tell them to replace you with someone who will be willing to cooperate. Needless to say, a short while after that, Temba gets redeployed out of GCIS. Now, somebody who held the post of DG in the presidency, but who has really been from the 70s up until now, a pivotal figure in all parts of our liberation struggle, all, all parts of rebuilding work in the country. Um, Reverend Frank Chikani, the convener of the Defend Our Democracy campaign. Reverend, you and people who will come after you have three minutes to give us your messages, your, your views and your perspectives. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sean. I, I would like to complete, start by completing your story. That as um, Maseko was going in and out of the Gupta's compound, uh, he interacted with me uh, at the same time and indicated what was happening. And when he was asked to act in the way he did, he asked me what needs to be done. I said, you can do what the president instructs you, but once they cross the line in terms of criminality or corruption, that's where you need to stop. Indeed, he visited those people, the Guptas and per instruction of the president. And then when they asked him, to do what you've just talked about. He said, no. And for that, he lost the job. He didn't only get de deployed, but he ended up leaving the public service. So it was very costly for Maseko. But I would like to thank the Katrada Foundation for taking the lead in launching this campaign to bring the Guptas back to South Africa, to face the charges of corruption, fraud, and racketeering. We have made this call before, and thank you for responding to this call, that we need to, to mobilize the international community to assist us to put pressure on the United 
um, Emirates uh, to make sure that the Guptas are brought back here to face the charges. As many of you would know, the Defend Our Democracy campaign uh, came into being early this year because of the toxic mix of corruption, criminality, and capture of the stage, which threatened our democracy. It is one thing to deal with corruption only, which is a, a major problem in the international space. But when that gets brought together with criminality and the capture of the state, then it threatens our democracy. And that's why we took a stand that we're not going to allow this to happen in this country early this, this year, and that we needed to ensure that those who are corrupting the state and state in entities, including corrupting the security forces so that they don't get arrested, and went as far as corrupting the intelligence services of the country. When you do that, that amounts actually to a coup d'etat. You actually are committing a treasonable act to make sure that the state does not serve the interests of the people, but it now serves the interests of individuals who are in power or those who are in business or collaborators together. All the evidence presented at the Zondo Commission suggests that the Guptas were major players in the capture of the state and the wholesale looting of resources of the state and moving large amounts of money to offshore destination. And the evidence suggests that criminal underground networks were used to do this. As South Africans, we took a stand to stop the cult capture of the government, our government, and stop the capture of state entities. We demanded that those who were involved in the capture of the state and state entities, both in government and in the private sector, be charged for their treasonable acts. Obviously, we expected there would be resistance, and indeed, it came um, in a big way. Uh, we got the former president defying the courts and, and um, resisting, um, cooperating with the courts, and we got militia groups camping at his place to make sure he does not get arrested or go to jail. And, and, and that threatened our, the stability of the country because once that happens, then you have an instability in the country. His arrest, as you know, it's now history and sending him to jail resulted in an insurrection which is called a failed insurrection in this country. And it led to more than 350 people dying and billions of rents of property and businesses destroyed. And many people lost their jobs just because people do not want to comply with the courts of this country and face the consequences of their actions. The criminal activity spared us, especially this failed insurrection, spared us to intensify our campaign to make sure that this country is free from criminal activity, um, lawlessness, and that those who work outside the law need to go to jail. And this is where the issue about the Guptas come in. They are critical in this regard and the concern of ordinary people in this country is that those who have money escape going to jail, but the poor go to jail every day. And we need the world to assist us 
to bring the Guptas back here in South Africa and face the consequences of their acts. And this is what this campaign is about. And I thank the foundation for facilitating its launch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reverend Chikani. Um, you'll be followed by Wayne Duvenaj from Outta and then Karim Singh from Corruption Watch. Wayne? Hi. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, and uh, well done to, to the Akbar Katrala Foundation and uh, Zakira and Nabila. This is important work in Corruption Week. So uh, just from our point of view, we, we'd like to just say that, you know, in the past three years, uh, ARTA has worked closely with enforcement agencies and the prosecuting authorities, not only uh, to report alleged criminal activities, but also provide so much information and, and uh, intelligence and evidence to fight corruption, uh, more specifically regarding state capture. And even though it's been more than four years, uh, since the Gupta leak surfaced, uh, we're still finding new evidence which exposes those who made it possible for the uh, Guptas uh, to gain access to billions of rands of South African taxpayers' money. Uh, civil society has endured and ensured that we uh, remain focused on uncovering corruption, in particular uh, relating to the uh, Guptas and state capture, um, whilst making sure that the law enforcement agencies uh, keep up the pressure. And, and to ensure that there's successful prosecutions. Uh, and we have a big concern as to how long it is taking uh, and the inaction uh, against the backdrop of so much uh, uh, strong evidence. There have been a number of reports and books written about this looting it is, that has crippled the country um, and the losses that run into billions of rands, if not trillions over time. Uh, and this month, Arta launched its book uh, titled Permitted Plundering, which gives an account of our parliament failed in their duty to the people of this country by aiding and abetting state capture through their silence and inaction. And we believe these are acts of crime and treason, and they cannot go unpunished. And as indicated in the presentation earlier, it's estimated that the Gupta family alone, uh, along with their business associates, have robbed South Africa of approximately 57 billion rand, going back almost a decade now. And through their close relationship with political leaders and state-owned entities and uh, uh, management, the, the Guptas um, were a major factor in the reasons for thousands of hardworking South Africans having lost their jobs and livelihoods. They handed their co-conspirators some crumbs while they stashed the bulk of their loot in foreign countries, and they should not be allowed to live or conduct business in any country in the world from the funds or with the funds that they have looted from South Africa. And what astounds us uh, here in South Africa uh, is that the international authorities and the local authorities have allowed the Guptas and their associates to, to walk freely uh, without being held accountable. Uh, in, in Dubai, South Africa, and other parts of the world for far too long now. No country in the world should give criminals like the Guptas and their associates any room uh, to manoeuvre and escape justice. And we've spoken at length about this, uh, this time last year, and the year before, and the one before that. And we stand here today doing the same thing, and it just cannot be allowed to continue. And it's for this reason that we call on the criminal justice systems, both here and internationally, to up their game and to start taking their job seriously when it comes to holding corrupt individuals to account. With all the evidence that we have, it should never take this long to hold the Guptas and their connected cronies and politicians to account. The public want to see the governments of South Africa and the United Arab Emirates to work harder and a lot faster and arrest those who have blatantly stolen from South Africa, make our country, and, and in doing so, they've made our country a lot poorer and generated a lot of sufferings uh, to millions of our citizens. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Um, thanks for just the, the commitments of, of, of Outa, the ongoing work to mining the Gupta leaks. All of that information we, we, we will use to, or we are using to compile this orange book, which, which will come out in 2022. You, Karam Singh, um, Karam, I, am I correct? You are now the CEO of Corruption Watch. And if I'm correct, welcome to this post 
and 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 we look forward to your leadership um, and, 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 and 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 continuing the work, the wonderful work of Corruption Watch. Over to you, Karim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everybody. Um, a big thanks to the Katrata Foundation and to the other partners who've been involved in launching this campaign. Uh, Corruption Watch has been very happy to participate in the campaign up to this point. And I think it's fair to say that you have our full support uh, for the campaign, for its formulation, for its implementation uh, to the point where hopefully we can, we can see some justice. I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, we get together today on International Anti-Corruption Day. This is a day that's been observed since 2003, uh, uh, and it's linked to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Uh, the focus for this year is on the rights and responsibilities of everyone, including states, government officials, the private sector, and civil society in tackling corruption. And I think this is clearly uh, sees great alignment in terms of our own national anti-corruption strategy and the notion of a total society approach to fighting corruption. I think it's important to note the two relevant sub-themes in this year's uh, uh, International Anti-Corruption Day. The first relates to the private sector. Uh, and this talks about the narrative here is the role that the private sector needs to play, pro the proactive role that, that the private sector needs to play in countering corruption by educating, educating and training employees as in its business interest to do so. But it also, I think, is, is remiss in terms of not focusing in on the enabling role that the private sector has played. And I think this also sort of in terms of our international engagement needs to be a focus, the notion around corporate accountability for corruption. The, the other th sub theme that gets spoken about is the need for international cooperation. And I think it's important, and I think we can reflect upon the role that uh, uh, the international community played historically in the fight against apartheid, particularly in the uh, development of a kind of sanctioning regime as a kind of tactic to fight apartheid. We know that uh, in the context of that, that there was a lot of sanction busting and that we saw banks uh, uh, facilitate money laundering and, and the, you know, the, the provision of arms into the country. Well, you know, we've come full circle when it comes to this notion of international sanctioning. And I think as part of our bouquet of anti-corruption measures, we need to think about how we can now begin to really deepen our engagement with the international community in the push for uh, sanctioning for not only for corruption, but also for gross violations of human rights. So I was able to participate in a webinar yesterday hosted by Washington-based Human Rights First. I believe some of those colleagues are on this call today, who've been quite instrumental in developing something called the Magnitsky Sanctions. There's a statute in the US and the UK, I believe there's a new statute that's coming online in Australia that, that makes it then difficult for those who've been implicated in corruption from traveling freely and from being able to bank their, uh, their, their uh, gains from corruption easily. I think this is something we need to consider and we need to push for domestically in terms of our own Magnitsky sanctions. Uh, uh, and I, I think that's part of the law reform uh, uh, approach to the campaign. So why do we support the campaign? Certainly public education, mobilization, advocacy are at the heart of what Corruption Watch is about. We understand the value of keeping the Guptas and their associates in the public spotlight and highlighting the link between corrupt actions and the socioeconomic challenges we face as a country. So what, what, can you can, what can you expect from Corruption Watch in support of this campaign? We certainly will engage in all public education aspects, uh, advocacy in terms of raising awareness within our networks, sharing materials, developing materials for social media, uh, for newsletters, for mobilization in terms of the campaign. We will participate actively in the promotion of, as I've talked about, uh, uh, the implementation of additional sanctions and lobbying efforts around extradition. I think we need to be mindful, uh, you know, particularly as we've called for prosecutions for a long time of the precarious state that the MPA finds themselves in. 
I think it, it, it raises questions for us as civil society in terms of how we engage with the prosecution services, how we engage with law enforcement, particularly in a moment where there's still a significant trust deficit and there's a significant accountability deficit. So uh, we need to support the, the MPA and their efforts, but we also need to continue to put pressure on them constructively to ensure that they're able to do what they need to do to, to recapacitate themselves and to uh, realize their mandate. So um, again, big thanks to all of the parties who are joining us this evening. You have the full support of Corruption Watch in this campaign. And uh, we really look forward, particularly with the release of the Zondo Commission report to engaging with the findings and recommendations of that report and building a coherent and you know, really united civil society approach to how we take some of these issues forward in, in 2022. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karam. Wonderful to hear those specific commitments. Um, and you're followed now by Jacob Mamabolo from the South African Communist Party, Gauteng. And, and the party has really been um, critical to, to much of the, the work against state capture uh, and, and, and that support, I think, has is, is been hugely appreciated. So over to you, uh, Jacob Mamabolo from the party. You'll follow by Morketsi from Right to Know. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, Chair and Program Director. Um, let me, on behalf of the SACP, in the province of Gauteng, greet you, uh, all the leaders of the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation, greet uh, all the um, organizations uh, and all leaders that are part of this very important campaign. And uh, we also want to extend our greetings and appreciation to all the friends and allies in the entire global community that are part of this very important campaign. The South African Communist Party joins the people of our country, the province, the whole world in calling for the return of the Gupta family and their associates um, to come back to South Africa to face the full might of the law for the crimes that they've committed. I think uh, the foundation has given and the leadership that is here has given details uh, of how deep, severe and quite serious are the crimes that are faced uh, by the um, Gupta family. Uh, we believe that uh, South Africa as a uh, sovereign state founded on the principles of the rule of law, a democratic country, uh, it's within its right to call on all uh, countries that are giving protection to the Guptas to let them come back and face the full might of the law on the crimes that they've committed. The struggle for the liberation of South Africa was supported by the people of the world. We will only succeed if this campaign is fully supported by our comrades and friends internationally the Guptas have eroded the capacity of our state to bring a quality of life, to meet the ideals of our Matthias, Ahmed Kathrada, Nelson Mandela, many of them, uh, to give quality of life to the people of South Africa. And as the SACP, we are very much grateful of the leadership of the foundation and uh, to all the um, comrades and friends in South Africa globally, we are quite confident that victory is certain uh, through struggle, through hardship, through hard sacrifice, the Guptas will finally be held liable for completely attacking the core and fabric of our democracy. And in that regard, the SACP once more recommit to be part of this campaign and to make sure that we defend, protect and advance our democracy that came at a huge cost to life both here at home and internationally. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I expected the viva at the end, but uh, somehow you restrained. Uh, more, more catsy from right to no. 
Thanks and um, greetings to everyone. I hope um, I'm audible. You are? The Right to Know campaign welcomes the opportunity uh, to make an input in this important campaign. Um, as we all know, we are a coalition of organizations and individuals who try to defend and open up democratic space for communities and organizations to take up their own struggles. And so we are like a, a, a train, a train track that, it, that enables the train to reach um, uh, its destination. We made a commitment and a promise as an organization to boldly and directly challenge the unjust um, corporate state and all other uh, undemocratic powers which, which are existing um, because we are all aware that um, undemocratic power uh, corrupts and it destroys. It, it destroys. We, cut, we gotta hear in a time of a, a global economic and social um, economic uh, ecological uh, crisis. We live in poverty. Um, there is inequality around us and social and political instability as noted by the Reverend. On this day, um, the anti-corruption day, we reiterate that all this uh, that is happening in South Africa is partly uh, as a result of this family that we are calling uh, to, uh, to be brought back. Um, the role that was played by KPMG uh, report on the SARS, which directly um, put our fiscal sovereignty undermined and led to the for, a shortfall that was reported to be around 50 million billion is just an example of that. Um, we have learned how that report uh, set in motion the departure of some senior staff members in SARS and some were pushed out uh, to, to resign. Um, I guess the predatory uh, farm industry um, and the direct channeling of the public money to finance uh, the Gupta family's wedding um, got the, the public talking for a long time and it's documented. The Guptas and their lieutenants uh, through different uh, subsidiaries out our SOEs. They also disrupted operations uh, in ESCOM, as um, I mean, can be noted through McKinsey and uh, the Trillion Capital. So this um, campaign um, joins the efforts of people um, like the ex uh, the Trillion CEO who. Uh, basically build a, the cap on how these people are milking our nation. I, I think that is uh, Bianca. We also note the contribution of, um, a, a, I mean, Suzanne Daniels, uh, who put a spanner in the works by investigating how, and showing how the ESCOM deal was basically in the interest of um, these people in the long run um, while it is favored um, ESCOM. And um, we understand that um, about 1 billion uh, uh, of rents was going to be channeled to McKinsey uh, for the work that could be done by internal uh, normal operations team uh, in, 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 in ESCOM. And as you see now with the protests that are happening in Suwetu, uh, people of Suwetu um, are, are, are the testament to that. We respect uh, Lord Peter Hain, um, who called for action uh, to be taken against companies and, and banks who were uh, complicit to state capture. 
So our call for um, the group uh, is to be brought back is fueled by the knowledge and the understanding that uh, the corruption nest in, in our country is home for several multinational companies. And remember, we took a, 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 a commitment to fight uh, this unjust and undemocratic power. And those multinational company, companies, uh, as it has been noted, include um, international law firms, uh, software companies, the banks, uh, the management consultants, public relations companies, as well as um, the auditing of companies, um, as we have seen with KPMG. So if we are able to bring this family back, uh, this would be a very big step in the consequence management in this country. And it would be a very big step of uh, in holding corporate corruption uh, accountable. As we have seen, um, our, our sister organization, Open Secret, has been hard at work in highlighting and compiling uh, evidence that shows how the private corporations okay. like. Thank you. Can you round up now? Yes, um, I mean, these private corporations have assisted the apartheid crimes and uh, a call to stand against the Guptas uh, need to happen now. So we commit to mobilize and advocate on the crowd uh, for this to happen. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. No, we appreciate the support, the commitment from Right to Know uh, and, it, and, and recognize the importance if of its work on championing the issues of transparency and access to information. Um, we have a short message to be read out on behalf of Mosilo Matepo. Now Mosilo, people might remember, um, is, is the person who blew the whistle on SAA. Her disclosures resulted in the freezing of trillion associated company regiments capital and a high cost order for trillion to pay back almost 600 million to ESCOM as well. Um, the, oh, Nabila will read this message. Nabila, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. B. So um, I will be reading out a few excerpts from Masilo's book titled Uncaptured. The beautiful sunset and the good wine lost their charm. All of a sudden, I was petrified. My heart started palpitating and I began to sweat. The incumbent finance minister, Pubin Gordon, was also in the news that day. He was being targeted by the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation, commonly known as the Hawks, which had been set up by the Zuma administration to investigate organized crime, economic crime, and corruption. The Hawks had requested that Gordon provide them with a warning statement, a step sometimes taken before a suspect is charged and arrested. For pending four charges relating to the early retirement of former, South, of former South African Revenue Service SARS Deputy Commissioner Ivan Pillay on full benefits in 2009 and his later reinstatement as an independent consultant. I was pretty sure that these were trumped up, trumped up charges designed to smear the finance minister's reputation and neutralize him. Gordon was being persecuted for investigating con contracts with companies owned by the Guptas. I recalled how Tebeho had told me in March that the president intended in firing Gordon. I suspected the charges would be laid and that Zuma would use this opportunity to tell cabinet that the minister must step aside to deal with these very serious allegations. Gordon had refused to appear before the Hawks to give the warning statement and the Sunday Times on 28th August had carried a full page article about his brave stand under the headline, I'm prepared to die to save South Africa from the thieves says Gordon. He had told his staff at Treasury that he would never back down in his fight against corruption. As I scrolled through my newsfeed, I was in turmoil. The picture was drawing into sharper focus. I knew that I was connected with what was going on back home. I realized that I had a VIP seat from which to observe looting and corruption on a grand scale. What I had witnessed was not just undue enrichment or undue influence as stated in the public protector's terms of reference. It was blatant corruption that ran into millions of rands. 
Trillion was an extension of the Guptas, and I was part of that. I had information, but what should I do? At first, I told myself that someone else will do it. Someone else will come forward with the information that will help Tuli Madensela and protect Praveen Gordon. Who am I? I have no influence. I have no ANC credentials. I am not a minister. I was not born into a family of wealth and influence. Like Moses who asked, who am I that I should go? I thought I am just, I am just a 1.58 meter black woman with size three and a half shoes and childlike hands. Believe me, I didn't want to get involved, but I was involved. In fact, I could face jail time for what I had unwittingly been a part of at Trillion. I thought about the famous saying attributed to Irish philosopher Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Or in my case, good women. Am I a good woman? I asked myself. Evil was triumphing in South Africa. Patriots had to stand up against the country's destruction. It was my duty to come forward. But what if they kill me, I thought. But then which side of history do I want to be on? Am I going to allow fear to dictate my next move? The questions went around and around in my head. Sipping my Chardonnay, perhaps emboldened by Dutch courage. The question that finally resolved it for me was this. What is more dignified for my mother to lay a wreath on my casket knowing I did the right thing? or for her to visit me in prison bearing tampons and contraband. A wreath or tampons? For me, it was the wreath. I went back to the Sunday Times article and read again what Praveen Gordon had said, that he is willing to die to stop the thieves from stealing our country. I had never met Praveen, but I knew that I couldn't let him die alone. My story had played out in the media and it's well known. But, I want, but what I want to impart is the wisdom and strength that I received. I want to encourage other people to speak up, even if it's difficult. For drastic change, there has to be pain. All revolutions require blood, sweat, and tears. Anything worthwhile requires sacrifice. Every generation faces a crisis of some sort, and it requires people who are willing to stand up. People who are exiled imprisoned or killed to end apartheid and give us democracy. Our fight against state capture and corruption is not in the trenches or in the streets. It is in the boardroom. At least with the boards, you could see them coming. But when it comes to corruption, you don't even know who the enemy is. They are thugs in suits, sitting in plain sight in meeting rooms and offices. Thanks, Nabila. Let's leave it there. Thank you, Mr. B. Thank you. I, I mistakenly made reference to SAA with Masillo. In fact, it's it's a, a work led to, to to related to regiments and their work or supposed work at ESCOM. Uh, we have a short message from Cynthia Stimple. Uh, Cynthia, people will know it was the person who blew the whistle on SA on, at, at SAA, um, and eventually succeeded in stopping. Judy Miyeni and, and the work that she was doing and saving the taxpayer with over 250 million rands. Cynthia, over to you. Greetings to everyone. Thank you very much, Nishin, for having me. Thank you to the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation for organizing and managing this campaign. It is a very important campaign for our country right now to ensure that we start and um, hold people accountable. Um, so the Defend the Democracy with getting the Guptas back in pain, I see it as the first step for us. It, uh, it's not the end, it's the beginning. We have tried over the years, as said by previous speakers, that we need to get, um, hold people accountable. So. To go on, what, what have we suffered is the key thing that I'd like to focus on. Corruption is an indictment on our human rights. It is impacting the very fabric of our South African society. We've come out strong um, 1994 in our new democracy with the fields wide open for entrepreneurship, for business to grow, for is South Africa to be productive. Almost 30 years down the line, 
we face challenges. The challenges are many. Our basic needs are there, just such as education. We do not have a quality education. We do not have a quality health care, as we've seen, especially now in the past, um, well, last year with the COVID and current um, focus of how COVID is impacting our country, our health care system. Homes, we do not have quality homes allowing dignity for our people. And why? Because there isn't money to put into those areas. Because we've spent the time focusing on trying to fix issues through reasons being that we've been plagued by corruption. Our corruption has been so deep, so wide, spread out and stretching like a spider's web in various layers, in various institutions, private and public, even banks, auditing firms, legal fraternity, consulting organizations, high level citizens, ministers, our government, our municipalities. When we see this level of corruption, we ask ourselves, how can we fix it? What we do know is that the Guptas played a key role. They played such a pivotal role in every aspect at the time that we, they were there. The question I asked, what made them leave? They left because besides everyone challenging in many ways, the main reason they left was when their bank accounts were frozen. And I know that a red notice has been set, uh, sent out via Interpol. We're now very happy to know that um, there's um, indictment and extradition notice for them to, for, to come from the UAE to South Africa. However, more should be done. We need to ensure that they cannot open bank accounts anywhere in the world because what gave them the right to leave our country and go and live in another country as if nothing has happened. So no accountability, no charges that followed them, no sort of ban on them. There should be a travel ban. They should have all links to whatever they're doing. So whatever happens out of this extradition, we need to make sure they cannot function as business, they cannot function as individuals, that they need to repay the, the money. Obviously, that will come out in the court case. Passport should have been revoked, but that hasn't happened. And so how are we going to, uh, to do that? We, we, as South Africans, have allowed certain things to happen, not because we wanted it to, because we thought that we had a legal system that would take care of it. And now we realize that our legal system is no longer effective. How are we going to do it? Here, I would say that um, I would like to pledge my support. I think many of us are doing it um, for just background reasons. I have a company called Citizens of Conscience supporting whistleblowers. And the key thing I'd like to bring out in my last uh, conclusion is that there were whistleblowers throughout this whole Gupta story. And um, the first I heard was when Janice and Mr. Bisi came out and said that he's been bribed. Then when Mr. N uh, the then Minister Plantla uh, uh, Nene was, was fired, he also spoke out about um, what had happened. Um, there was the person from SAA, Vuzikona, that also spoke out that he was called to the offices and given um, an opportunity for 500,000. Um, and uh, Temba Maseko, Masilo uh, Matepo, Suzanne Daniel, they were the two people who, who gave the Gupta leaks. Those are the whistleblowers around bringing the information out around the Guptas. And then obviously the journal, journalists and the media were brought the story. What I'd like to encourage here is that people continue to speak out. We know that you are not protected. We know that you could lose your job. But the, the more we hide behind our fear, we're unable to change the situation. So for us right now is to encourage people to speak out because I'm sure there's still many who know more stories. And if you can just 
speak out. We're already working on how to help and protect whistleblowers. We've seen what has happened to Babita Diokaran. We know what has happened to, to, uh, to Bisa Zulu recently. But as you can see, just last night, they were honored by an external company who recognized the good that they've done, the courage they faced, that they stood up against the fear. And so this is where I'd like to come in and assist in just encouraging people to speak out, become active citizens of this country, support every NGO that you can, um, work where you can to ensure that we minimize corruption, because it's not an overnight thing, even if the start is getting the Guptas back and, and working on the issue and holding them accountable, but there are many others. There's the Baines in this world that still needs to be called back. There's the KPMGs. There's our own legal system. So all that, there's a lot of work to be done. So I'd like to encourage everyone that we need to roll up our sleeves, stand together, and uh, continue the good work. Thank you. No, thank you, Cynthia. Um, we, we now will just get a, a few messages from the international partners to this campaign. There's a message from Paul Holden, Shadow World Investigations. The Shadow World undertakes path-breaking investigations into cases of grand corruption, corporate malfeasance, and militarism, predominantly but not exclusively in the global arms trade. These case studies are used to highlight the blurred lines between business and state and indicate the legal and political reforms that are needed to halt the corrosive impact of criminal and institutional corruption. I would also encourage everybody here to just go and dig up the Daily Maverick archives on the four part uh, series that Paul Holden wrote in terms of the Guptas, the criminal uh, criminality, both here and across the world, in which I think, you know, if anybody doubts that this must be an international campaign, these articles put, will, 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 will put that to rest. So can we have his message, please? Hi, I'm Paul Holden. I'm currently Director of Investigations at Shadow World Investigations. In June this year, I gave extensive evidence before the Zondo Commission uh, about the cost of state capture. Uh, according to my calculations, based on documentation given to me by the Commission, 57 billion rand was spent on contracts affected by state capture. Of that amount, the Guptas earned over 16 billion rand. The amount the Guptas earned is equal to the cost to vaccinate every South African twice for COVID-19, uh, for every South African over the age of 19. Sadly, I, I fear those costs are a, a very large underestimate. There's lots of stuff we don't know about, but also those costs don't factor in things like the cost to our society in broad terms. It doesn't constitute, doesn't calculate the indirect and direct economic costs, it doesn't calculate the, frankly, enormous cost um, of the destroyed institutions and the destroyed lives uh, that was attendant on the process of state capture. When we talk about state capture, the, the phrase is somewhat anodyne, but what it really meant was for the entire state's capacity to function as a democratic, accountable state had to be destroyed in order to allow a relatively small group of people to make themselves obscenely rich. And that includes the Guptas. On that basis, it is an utter and total and complete outrage that the Guptas remain out of the reach of law enforcement in South Africa. And I think even more importantly, that their money, that their assets remain out of reach and they continue to live extremely opulent and luxurious and glamorous lives after having destroyed the state in South Africa and destroyed the capacity of the state to deliver what it needs to to South Africa's very desperately needy citizens. On this basis, I think that it's absolutely imperative. The Guptas have to return to South Africa. South Africans need to see that the Guptas are properly held to account for all their wrongdoing, that the people that they work with are named and shamed and put in jail, and that the money that they stole comes back into South Africa to do vitally important things like build the country again uh, into a functioning democratic state that serves all of its citizens equally and fairly and justly. So in order to reiterate, the Guptas must return and I support this campaign and wholeheartedly, as does Shadow World Investigations. Thank you. Great, w wonderful message from, from Paul Holden. Uh, now 
a, a, a message to be read out on behalf of Peter Hain. Thank you, Mr. B. Sorry, I cannot be with you and wish the campaign all the best. We have to target the key governments, principally the UAE over Dubai, China over Hong Kong, and India where the Guptas live, UK over its Caribbean offshore tax haven overseas territories. We also must insist that banks like HSBC, Standard Chartered, and Baroda Bank surrender the digital trails that will show where the Guptas and Zumas laundered their money. The corporates and lawyers that set up Gupta shell companies, mainly in Hong Kong, Dubai, and, Carib and the Caribbean, must also provide full details of their complicity in the looting and money laundering. Sincerely, Lord Peter Hayne. Good. Lovely practical stuff there from Peter Hayne as well. We now move to action uh, for Southern Africa. Uh, action for Southern Africa. Southern Africa is the successor organization to the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and the goal is to engage people with political, civil, and economic injustices in Southern Africa and to steer key people to drive change and deliver justice to those experiencing human rights violations uh, and inequality. They work with regional civil society partners to protect human rights, fortify movements for equality and democracy, relieve poverty and promote public education and research. And we, it, it's a huge pleasure to call Tony Dykes to give the message from Action for Southern Africa. Tony, over to you. Um, greetings from London to everybody. Um, I'm speaking as it's the former director of AXA and I'm now a member of its council. Um, as I'm in London, can I start by sending our condolences um, on the sad news of the death recently this week of Ambassador Lindy Mabusa, who was an excellent ambassador, High Commissioner for South Africa here and a stalwart in the struggle both against apartheid and for democratic South Africa. Um, as has been made clear, AXA for Southern Africa was set up by the British anti-apartheid movement in 1994 following the democratic election recognizing although a great victory had been won, many challenges and obstacles remain in the way of democratic South and Southern Africa to achieve development, poverty eradication, improve rights and reduce inequality. We believe this campaign is an important one and fully in line with our mandate and our objectives and therefore endorse it and support it and we'll look for the lead to come from South Africa, and we will do what we can to support the campaign. Um, we do so recognizing corruption doesn't just exist in South Africa. It exists worldwide, not least in our own country. And in whatever way we can, we will seek to challenge it. But of, as Action for Southern Africa, we have a focus on Southern Africa. Corruption is theft. It's an abuse of power. It's abuse of position. It's stealing, particularly from those who are without. It's stealing from the poor of South Africa. But it's even worse because it's a betrayal of that power, of that position. And it's corrosive. As Frank Chikani and others have made clear, it seeks to undermine and effectively destroy democracy. Therefore, he has to be cha cha challenged, overcome, and those who engage in corruption must be brought to justice. If they're not, those who haven't yet engaged in corruption will see it and see those who have benefiting and behaving and acting with impunity. If we do not challenge corruption, it will grow. And as it grows, it will steal more and more money, more and more resources, and be even greater corrosive. That's why Active from Southern Africa supports this. We commend the initiative of the Ahmed Kaltrada Foundation and we look forward to working with you and other organizations in South Africa so that South Africa can truly be the country it deserves to be for all its people. Wonderful message. Uh, thanks, Tony. Human Rights First is an independent advocacy and action organization that challenges America to live up to its ideals. It believes American leadership is essential in the global struggle for human rights and therefore presses the US government and private companies to respect human rights and the rule of law. 
uh, and, and the, the organization knows that it's not enough only to expose and protest injustice. It also has to create the political environment and policy solutions necessary to ensure consistent respect for human rights. On behalf of human rights, first, Adam Keith, your message, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Adam Keith. I'm with Human Rights First, an NGO based in the United States that focuses on accountability for serious human rights abuse and corruption. And thank you so much to the Kathrata Foundation for the invitation to join this group today and for organizing this important campaign. We see corruption as a threat to democracy and prosperity everywhere, and we believe that governments have a responsibility to help each other combat it. Uh, we joined with Corruption Watch earlier this year to call for the United Arab Emirates to cooperate with South African authorities as they investigate the role of several members of the Gupta family in corruption and state capture. We also welcomed the decisions of the US and British governments to impose targeted financial and visa sanctions on three members of the Gupta family and an associate. But turning the page on grand corruption, we recognize will require more accountability than that. So we support the Kathratas Foundation's call for all of South Africa's diplomatic partners to do more to help secure cooperation in this crucial case. And we look forward in 2022 to working to that end with South African and international civil society. Thank you. Adam, thank you so much for that. Um, so this is these are the range of contributions for today. A number of you have made have offered your time and your expertise to support this campaign. Uh, we would also need many of your ideas to be channeled back to the foundation so that we can take this forward. But just to read out the campaign statement, uh, I think it's important that, that the person who has been driving this kind of work uh, does this on, on behalf of, of this campaign and the foundation. Nabila, over to you. Thank you. The Amakathrado Foundation launches an international campaign to bring back the Guptas. It's a global collaboration and action to bring the Guptas to South Africa. The international campaign to bring back the Guptas, spearheaded by the Ahmed Kathrado Foundation with local and international organizations and activists, calls for the successful extradition of the Guptas to South Africa to account for the alleged involvement in state capture in South Africa. The Gupta family name has become synonymous with state capture, corruption, and fraud. The alleged corrupt acts said to have been committed by the Gupta brothers is no secret from shady backdoor deals to rigged contracts and the wholesale plunder of national resources. Currently, the Gupta family has fled South Africa and is presumed to be living in Dubai. An extradition treaty between South Africa and the United Arab Emirates was signed on the 9th of July, 2021. Earlier this year, the investigating directorate of the National Prosecuting Authority took former Gupta associate Iqbal Sharma, among others, to court over a 24.9 million alleged scam paid between November 2021 and April 2012 by the Free State Government to Nulani Investments, owned and controlled by Sharma. Additionally, the NPA is attempting a restraint of 1 billion rand on Regiment's Capital, an alleged Gupta-linked firm, as it is alleged to be the proceeds of crime. The international campaign aims to firstly ensure the said corrupt activities committed by the Guptas and their associates remain in the public spotlight. To secondly, lobby country ambassadors, officials, and bodies of authority to consider actions against the Gupta family and their businesses in their respective areas. And thirdly, to advocate and mobilize for the successful extradition of the Guptas to South Africa. The campaign is framed around three fundamental pillars. The first being advocacy and lobby, secondly, public education, and thirdly, pressure on all the responsible parties to speed up the extradition and prosecution of the implicated Gupta family members and their associates. The pillars serve as a guidance system for achieving the campaign aims. Following the campaign's launch, key actions for 2022 include ongoing lobby engagements with country officials and authorities, the commencement of public education and awareness sessions with communities, focusing on issues of corruption, its impacts on the state of the country and what can be done to counter it. And lastly, shedding light on the human cost of corruption through interviewing employees of Gupta-led or linked companies and sharing the experiences. The culture of corruption in South Africa is systemic. It does not exist in a vacuum. Therefore, to advocate for and ensure justice, we need to actively work towards bringing to the fore the web of individuals and companies who are complicit in the crimes of the corrupt. 
the Orange Book, Faces of Corruption, will be an ongoing action of the campaign and is a digital handbook that lists and details all who were and associated with the, with the Gupta's alleged crimes. We witnessed the orchestrated and systematic looting of our country's finances, resources, and institutions during state capture, with the total cost being almost 60 billion grand. We call for the consideration of the application of sanctions under the Magnitsky Act to be placed on the Guptas and their associates in countries with business interests. Magnitsky sanctions target those responsible for human rights violations or corruption. The United States placed economic sanctions under the Act on the Gupta brothers, as well as their associate Salim Essa. Additionally, the United Kingdom has also placed sanctions against the Gupta family under Britain's new Magnitsky Act. We urge the South African government, Department of Justice, National Prosecuting Authority, and the United Arab Emirates to act on the extradition treaty and bring the Guptas back to South Africa to account for the alleged corrupt activities. 9 December marks International Anti-Corruption Day, a symbolic and powerful moment that makes a clear call to political leaders, governments, legal and justice bodies, activists and citizens to join forces in the fight against corruption. The launch of this campaign is but, one, is but one of the many needed to ensure that the fight against state capture is kept going and will be continued until such time that one of the key drivers and beneficiaries of capture as seen in orange overalls after having gone through the, the judicial processes of South Africa. The Zondra Commission of Inquiry report into state capture is scheduled to be submitted to the president in January of 2022 and will subsequently be made public. Given the Gupta's centrality in the commission's work, we look forward to its findings and recommendations in general and on the Guptas in particular. This campaign will be one of the many responses to the report which should serve as the key guidelines on the program of work and action needed to eradicate state capture in South Africa. The very essence of our democracy is at risk from past and current state capture and compels us to ensure that this report does not end up gathering dust in the union buildings. This statement is supported by AUTA, Corruption Watch, the SECP, Defend Our Democracy, Masilo Matepo, Citizens of Conscience Foundation, NPC, Section 27, Right to Know, Shadow World Investigations, and Action for Southern Africa. Thank you. Thanks, Nabila. And, and once more, just thanks to everybody for your contributions, offers of support, as well as just your sharing of ideas. As we close the session, I think it's just important for me to, to just read an extract from Mkabisi Jonas's book. He writes in October 2015, the Gupta brothers offered me the position of Minister of Finance in exchange for 600 million. I had already become aware of the festering nexus between certain business people and politicians. I knew that the ruling ANC, like most transitional political parties was facing internal challenges and a new patronage and access to state resources were used by political brokers to rally support behind leaders and factions. I had put these issues down to the, cut and to the cut and thrust of an emerging democracy. I have been active in the struggle for democracy since I was 14, and I did not question the resilience of the ruling party to shepherd the country through these challenges. But the afternoon I was offered the bribe crushed this belief. I felt a deep sense of loss and disorientation as it dawned on me that the rumors of a parallel state were not only true, but had assumed a scale so audacious that South Africa's state building project had fallen headlong into the hands of business interests whose value system seemed directly opposed to that of the ANC that I knew. I thought of the years that we spent fighting for democracy. We lost our youth and we suffered at the hands of, apartheid, of the apartheid state. Now we were faced with this, a mafia state that threatened to usurp everything that we had fought for. In many ways, unlike apartheid, this felt like an invisible coup. And it is that note of despondency that we, that this campaign seeks to respond to. Because the one thing we cannot do is, is, is to render efforts at continued corruption and, and state capture uh, unchallenged. Um, even if there's a handful of people left 
we will still need to begin to speak out and do what is possible. But I am sure that given that all of the perception surveys in this country places the issue of corruption at number, number two or number three in terms of the big concerns of South Africans, it compels all of us to work more cohesively, all of us in civil society, it compels us to work with those in government who are serious about corruption, and it compels us to work with those in political parties who are clean, who are people with integrity, and who share the same set of values to find a way of, of channeling all of that energy to take on the mammoth nature of this task. This campaign is but one of many that I think will, will be underway in 2022. And we are looking forward to the release of the commission's report because I think that's gonna change the landscape in how we deal with the issue of, of state capture and how we respond to it. So I want to thank all of the speakers. I want to thank all of our partners. I want to thank in particular the media who have been covering this session live as well today. And we look forward to the rollout of this campaign uh, early in 2022. Thank you and, 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 and be safe, be COVID free. Uh, we need all of you around to take forward this campaign. Thanks, bye.